Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the World Wanderers Podcast. Today, we are very excited to continue with our travel and entrepreneurship series and be joined by Jen Long. Jen is a fellow Canadian. She's a world traveler, and she's also the founder of a really cool startup called Wandersnap. On this episode, we talk about so much different stuff. We talk about Jen's travel story, what inspired her to move to Asia, doing different work and projects over there, the travels that she got to do, and then what inspired her to create her company, Wandersnap. If you've never heard of Wandersnap before, it allows consumers who are in a location who want an on site photo shoot to connect with local photographers. So if it's your wedding day or you have an engagement or you just want some sort of sports or lifestyle event, you can just get that from Wandersnap and set it up, get your price point and find somebody who specializes in whatever you're looking for. So without further ado, here is Jen. We are very excited to be joined on the podcast today by Jen Long, who is the founder of Wandersnap and has had so many amazing travel experiences and travel stories, I'm sure. Uh, welcome to the podcast today, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're super excited to be chatting with you today. You're currently in Hong Kong, but you're originally from Canada? Sort of. <laughs> I think like most <laughs> of us, we're, we're, we're multinational by way of where we live, where we grow up. Um, I was born in Hong Kong. I uh, grew up in Vancouver, Canada, but then uh, my parents are Shanghainese. And so all three of those places are home. Amazing. That's awesome. It's funny being down in Mexico City because so many people will ask, you know, what's traditional Canadian food? And I feel like it's a really hard question to answer because so many of us are from, our heritage is from somewhere else. And so we have, you know, food that we traditionally eat in Canada, but we also have all these other things that we've integrated into our food from our, from our heritage. I'd probably say maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> I usually say poutine. <laughs> yeah, on maple, maple syrup on the poutine, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. So I, I think a good place to start would be to, you know, back up a couple of years and talk about what first inspired you to travel. Mm. I was very blessed that growing up, um, by nature of what my dad did for a business, uh, we were just on the road quite a bit. So I saw in him how much he was always away, um, how much he was always on the road. And then any excuse that we would get, um, the kids would get to go along as well. Um, so I think I caught the bug early on, um, just observing my parents. Um, and then, uh, once I went into college and um, had my own abilities to decide on where to go, that's when um, I just had this innate curiosity to just want to check them off and go see as many places as possible. Yeah, definitely. I think we could both relate to that. Yeah, definitely. So did you, did you leave Vancouver right after college then? Pretty much like four days as soon as uh, <laughs> four days after my last paper, I was on the plane and I flew to Shanghai. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. And did you did you do like slower travel, like base yourself in Shanghai, or did you kind of do Asia on, you know, that first kind of adventure you took? Yeah, so I think we could probably all relate to this, right? Where in the beginning it was all rapid fire, as many places as possible, short amount of time per trip, and you just wanted to say you've been to X amount of places um in a short period of time. Um so that was very much the beginning of, at the beginning of my career, at least being in a place where you are a hop of a flight from most places around the world. I think Hong Kong is a um, five hour flight from half of the world's population. And so being able to take advantage of that um, on weekend trips, excursions, uh, definitely did that towards the beginning. Um, and then as I think we grew older, it's more about finding the places that are true adventures or places that feel like home. Yeah, definitely. I, I can for sure relate to that. I feel like I got a little bit like travel hungry on mm -hmm. Ryan and I's first big backpacking trip where it was yeah. just like we were in Europe and everything's so close, similar to Asia, maybe even mm -hmm. closer. And just, you know, oh, we, we've got to go here too. And you, you lose a lot of it when you don't spend as much time there. Um, but I guess there's just pros and cons to each type of travel. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So what was it? So 
you went over for a job in Shanghai, right? Yes. Yes, I did. Well, so I know, you know, originally, um, you know, being born in Hong Kong, having mm -hmm. parents who, whose heritage is from Shanghai, but like growing up for most of the time in Vancouver, what was it like moving to Shanghai? Yeah. So I, I think to an extent, um, being around so many other Chinese and Asians in general in Vancouver, um, that I, I got preconditioned to think, uh, oh, well, my heritage is just a certain way. And in some cases, actually, probably even um, not ashamed, but slightly cautious on being too Asian or too Chinese, um, especially through the schooling system and whatnot. And it's just an unintended consequence, I think, in having so many migrant families congregate all in one place like Vancouver. Um, and, and so when I went back, it sounds strange, but even as a Shanghainese Chinese going back to Shanghai, it was, it was complete culture shock. Um, in fact, the first month I just, I, I struggled a lot on, you know, the judgment of why are things being done a certain way? Why is it not like the West? It's so backwards. And I just had a really, really tough time finding my purpose and how I'm going to last. <laughs> um, so I actually took a detour and I left Shanghai one month after going there, I spent a year and a half in Hong Kong with an amazing job and team. Um, and only after that was my mindset better preconditioned to think um, I'm ready to go back uh, into mainland China and just embrace whatever comes. And so the second time going back in, that's where I lasted um, almost six years. And it was the best chapter Um Grateful that, of course, the city and the country also just experienced tremendous growth during that time. But it definitely, I still had to uh, assimilate or, or, or experience China differently, even though I was um, by heritage Chinese. That's really interesting to hear. I, I feel like that's not what I would have imagined would have been the case at all. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's just different wherever you go and wherever you live, even though it's, you know, similar culture. Yeah, Absolutely. And so you went back to Shanghai and you were working there for those six years? Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, by and large, just worked at different uh, Western brands that were launching into China and um, our team did that. And so with that in itself, even traveling with work or traveling personally, um, I just, I, I'm so grateful for those few years um, being able to be based um, in such a vibrant city. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we had a couple of days in Shanghai last year, and it's it's really amazing. <laughs> did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, very cool. Just like so gigantic. Yeah, um, it was also colder than I. We went in like late November, I think. Yeah, late November, and it was uh, much colder than I imagined in my head. Uh, <laughs> Which doesn't it, make any like sense. A, when I don't map. didn't associate it with um, being cool, but yeah, really cool city. Just like so modern, like especially, you know, lots of places it feels like you're in the future. Yeah. Well, that's not the sentiment that most people would think of, right? If they've never been to China, modern, futuristic are probably not the adjectives that come to mind. Um, and that's just the best part about being able to live somewhere. I would imagine it's like where folks went to New York in the 20s um, and they wanted to get a, a feel for what tomorrow would feel like. I feel like that's where um, we experienced it in Shanghai. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had similar thoughts about Singapore mm. um, where it was like, this is probably what, yeah. In the, when America was, you know, really at the cutting edge of things like that was probably what it was like for people mm. going there. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I know you've done, I think from, from, uh, looking into in our research before, um, close to 50 countries. So during that time when you were based in China, were you doing a lot of travel, um, outside of China at the same time or what, what was that like? Yeah, I made a concerted effort to also see as much of China as possible as well. Um, and then outside of, um, the, as much as, um, China it just feels like it's one entity. Um, it's almost as big as continental Europe. And if you imagine the, the landscape differences, cultural differences, um, the Western parts are largely more nomadic, um, almost like a Eurasian influence with tribal, uh, with tribes on horsebacks, um, moving around in yurts. And then all the way down in the South where you get, uh, almost strange architectural, um, structures. 
uh, like those too low, which are circular housing complex, complexes. Um, and then, of course, in the north, you get a lot more almost Soviet, Korean influences the further north you go. Um, so within China, that in itself, there were so many mountains to hike, um, cities to explore, and then definitely around Asia, um, I wanted to see as many of the neighboring countries as possible. Yeah, that's amazing. And can you talk about some of, I guess, your most memorable travel experiences or craziest travel experiences or just the ones that kind of stand out for you? So many. <laughs> Sometimes it's like it's, wow. it's 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 like what's your favorite country? <laughs> yeah, it's like well, I don't know, like which which climate, which month, which region of the world are you asking for? <laughs> it, it's all it's all a, a, a gratefulness question, right? And you only it, it goes to show like just how awesome it is to be able to experience so much and then reflect back on it. Um, I think the most unique, at least. Um, for sure, the first um, Pyongyang marathon where foreigners could go into North Korea to run. Uh, I think we had a delegation of about 250 foreigners. Um, nowadays, it's it's almost like a year. It is a yearly event, if not more. Um, but we were the first class of um, runners, if you will, and so that was just inherently a different type of adventure, thrill, and eye openness. Um, the second was we were so lucky in going to Myanmar, um, pretty much the fall after the country reopened up again to foreign travel. And the night we landed into Yangon International Airport, um, the, their, the sort of their country's mother figure, Aung San Suu Kyi, was uh, coming back um, for the first time. So she's been on house arrest. She was never allowed to leave the country for 11 years. And that trip, it was her first time leaving Myanmar to go pick up her uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, the airport was just commotion. I've never seen so many people standing out, dancing, cheering. And I thought that was their welcome party every night. (laughs) (laughs) Then I realized, oh, the mother figure of their country, and now she's sort of the figurehead president of the country. She was landing back into Yangon for the first time. So that was just magic. Um, And then then some other things are... um, yeah, just uh, we we experienced a matriarchal tribe in rural Yunnan in China, where this village is still run by women. Um, the men actually are forced to leave the village when they get to a certain age. So it's true and true um, women in power type tribal village. Um, and then just skiing in like uh, Kazakhstan. That was also just um, something totally off the grid. <laughs> Yeah, wow, those are incredible experience to, experiences to have had. And I've got to ask, like, what was that marathon like in North Korea? Yeah, so part part of the most thrilling bit was the fact that nowadays there's not very many excursions or things you do without being able to research on it, right? So if we hop on any of the blogs, listen to your podcasts, or just scrape through Instagram, by and large, you kind of get a feel for a place and what to expect and things to do. Um, But with this marathon, there just wasn't any research prior. So all that filtered through our agents, uh, filtered through the actual tour guide on the day. So the mystery of it was so much part of, I think, what old adventures would have been like. You just show up. You just, you, you're prepared for whatever. Um, even the chaos the night before the race, there were conflicting opinions as to whether or not we were allowed music, we were allowed cameras during the run. Um, obviously there were some pretty seasoned runners who had their own routine. So if you tell somebody who has raced marathons on their iPod and that was how they set their rhythm, telling them that they can't have this uh, for this race, uh, generated some commotion. Um, and even like minutes before the race started, imagine we were all lined up by category and we had to walk into the stadium. Uh, and that was the starting and ending point. And it was like hockey games where you could see from outside of the gates, the amount of people and the entire stadium was filled. Um, and when you do the walk around the stadium to the starting line, you, you genuinely see them in districts. Like you would have one column of them, uh, evidently farmers by what they wear, their skin color, sort of the wrinkles on their face and just how tight they were. And then the next section would be 
um, well-to-do Pyongyang citizens who were in dresses and Western suits. Um, and just that was all before the race. So by the time when the gun fired and you're just running sometimes alone through the streets of Pyongyang, it's just been an incredible experience. And now I would imagine um, it's a lot more policed, um, but it's still definitely a worthy experience to go and try. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah, what a unique way to see, you know, a country that so few people in the world have that opportunity to see. Yeah, and I remember distinctively um, at one point, I think like uh, halfway through the race. Uh, so there, there are about, I want to say, fifty to sixty local kids who also run this, and for whatever reason, I can't even imagine they've been placed to run this marathon, and all of them are distinctively shorter, skinnier, and just less nourished um, than the Westerners. But they run almost with the purpose that it's just a different pace and a different intensity. You can see it on their faces. And at one point during the race, I had to go to the bathroom. So I, I ran off track. I went into some restaurant <laughs> thinking to myself, I'm just in some random restaurant in, in the middle of North Korea. Um, and then when I joined the race, back again um there was one kid right in front of me i call him kid only because by height he was significantly shorter but it's really hard to tell their age and mm -hmm. it was just the two of us down this tunnel and out of nowhere behind us there was a motorbike that drove in and on the back of the motorbike was an asian lady who was screaming at the top of her lungs and i gathered she must have been his mom and she was just yelling at him to run faster, keep going. And just that sort of maternal love or just parental expectations um, filtered through. You know, I don't think that's unique to Vancouver or to Shanghai. <laughs> but in the middle of a tunnel in North Korea, I saw that also. <laughs> wow. Wow, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, what a, like, purely human moment. <laughs> yeah, purely. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're all the same regardless of where we're from. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. So, so over um, over that six years in Shanghai, did you spend much time in Canada or, or were you just kind of based there all year round? Yeah, so I, um, like most expats, I think, um, probably get trips home. Um, I was grateful at the time I worked for, uh, during my time in Shanghai, half of it I worked for a Canadian company. So I got to fly back to Canada um, with the company. And then the other half I was with an American company. Um, so then flew back with them to L.A. quite a bit. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. And so I know you've got entrepreneurial stuff going on now. Um, did your time working for, it was Tom's and Lululemon, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Did your time working with them and helping them open, you know, their flagship stores over in China, did that really influence you wanting to open your own company? Mm, I think those were the best um, practice runs, if you can say that, where uh, the job was no different than an entrepreneur in in that you're just taking company um, budgets to start open the first team, open the first office, open the first stores. Um, so the exercise itself was very much entrepreneurial anyway. Um, but the biggest difference, I think, it's once you realize you have something you're willing to go to bat for, then why wouldn't you do that for yourself and your vision and the future that you see rather than somebody else's dream. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. And I want to dive into that more and, and get into, you know, what you do at Wandersnap and where that came from. Um, but I'm curious, and there must be challenges around, you know, taking a company concept, like a Canadian company, and getting it into a country like China or, you know, any other country in the world just with regulations and language barriers and that sort of thing. Did you experience that firsthand? Yeah, I mean, that was that was the work was how do you take something that really succeeded in the West um, and then replicate that lifestyle or at least localize it? So to give you an example where before we had even set up um, Lululemon, uh, the first team structures, etc., it was strange to run in your spandex on the streets of Shanghai. Locals mm -hmm. would take out their not even camera phones then. It was genuine cameras. Or they'll run along with you and just inquire why you're doing that, what purpose is that for, um, all the way to throwing the first, you know, thousand person yoga event. 
in Shanghai, it just, there's tremendous amounts of understanding, learning mistakes, um, and just trial and error. Um, and definitely it was a team effort, but so much fun to be able to do that for concepts that you believe in and genuinely see behavioral change, um, on a pretty significant scale. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm sure that would have been pretty, pretty crazy in, uh, in Shanghai. I remember the first time I went to Europe, like I grew up in Canada, so I've worn Lululemon mm-hmm. my whole life. And since then I've worked, I've worked for the company as well. Um, but I remember traveling in Europe and the women dress very like classy or yeah. fancy on airplanes. And like, for me, it's like my Lulus, <laughs> like all Lulu, like a hoodie, sports bra runners, you know, <laughs> leggings, that sort of thing. And being like, why on earth are you wearing heels on this plane? But they're looking at me like, what is this girl doing in her pajamas? Like we're in public. Right. <laughs> right. And now it's athleisure. There's a whole term for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious over over that time, six years of living in Shanghai, um, how your kind of like experience of it changed? Like if it if it you know came to feel a lot more like home, or if you you know felt like it kind of like it didn't fit the whole time, or wh- how that kind of evolved. It went from me being a misfit to me just being an absolute awe of how quickly a place can mature and grow up. I mean, day to day while you're living there it almost doesn't feel like it. You just, there is an amount of grit. I think that's involved. Um, it's just when the the city changes so much day to day, you're just constantly in the flow. There's so many people around. It is one of those like wild, wild west situations where you have to stand your own ground and be critical of people are taking advantage of. Um, but at the very least, it was a city of entrepreneurs. Everyone's there to start something all the way from your restaurant owner to startup entrepreneur down to the person who's, you know, running a, a, a chestnut stall on the corner. They were all just trying to make something happen and being around that energy. I don't think there's very many cities where that's still so vibrant and on the forefront um, there are also a lot of low hanging fruits. So being able to take advantage of those or see friends who created a businesses around them, um, was really just a fun process to be surrounded by those personalities. And now when you look back and reflect, this is a city that it's cashless. You don't really bring around your wallet. You just show up with your phone and you pay everything via your QR code tied to your WeChat account. You can rent bikes, you can pay for cabs, you can call for groceries delivered to your home. Um, and then you can even rent power banks um, because in the cashless economy, your phone is your wallet. So you can even rent uh, these power banks for an hour if your phone is um, off uh, w- without battery. So just the fact that this was a city six years ago where you're still yelling at the top of your lungs just to catch a cab um, to how modernized it is now Um I'm sure it's a chapter that I'm not really going to forget. And I look forward to going back at some point. Yeah, definitely. That's an amazing to experience so much change in such a short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, at what point was it when you were in Shanghai or, or maybe you had, you had moved at that point, but what was kind of the chain of events that led you to starting Wondersnap yeah. or to, to the idea of it? Yeah, I think there were a few key moments. One was when I realized I wanted to do something with impact for the rest of my career. It didn't matter where, what I was doing, but that was a non-negotiable for me to feel like um, I was adding purpose to other people's days. And the moment that I traced back to was um, we were rural, Kathmandu in Nepal, Um, I'd taken some time off from work um, to photograph for a local newspaper. And in this village, um, the power generator shut off at around 6 p.m. at night um, to conserve for the next day. And it was a whole farming collective. Um, It was actually also women run. So uh, the women were the ones um, pulling their money into the commune, uh, sharing the profits in order to send each other's kids to school uh, buying new equipment, ca- cattle stock, etc. So it was just fascinating. Um, even in the middle of this very, very um, male-dominated society, um, there was this women collective. So we were shooting, 
And every night, since I didn't speak uh, the local language, uh, after dinner, there weren't really a much I could get up to. There wasn't you know, TV. I wouldn't fidget on my electronics as I had to conserve power the next day. It was way too hot and arguably unsafe to walk around the street outside. And so every night I just had to do something to fall asleep. And as vain as it sounds, I started counting the rupees in my wallet. Um, and just like the Indian rupee, it's, it's, uh, a huge stack of, um, cash, uh, for not necessarily a lot of value. And so I would just count it to monitor my daily spending. And I realized I never spent more than free USD a day. And you can read about the poverty line and, and, and in the economists and know the numbers, but until you're counting literally the rupees, it sunk on me that, you know, I was grateful for three curry meals, bottled water to wash my hair, consume, even sacks on the road. And I never spent more than three USD a day. And there I was, I was doing a job that sold hundred dollar stretchy pants. So for every pair of pants sold, that's 30 kids we can feed daily for three meals a day in clean water. And just the math of it dawned on me that there's still so much to do. And while it may not be everyone's responsibility or calling, I felt like I was motivated to do something about that throughout my career. Um, and then just throughout my time, uh, whether it was with Lululemon and Tom's, I saw how much consumers and businesses craved content, especially nowadays with an Instagram world. A hotel can make and break just by having an amazing Instagram account. And being able to do it affordably, instantly, and at a mass scale was something that I wanted to build around. Um, so fast forward, you know, the company's been around for a year now. Uh, we're in 58 cities. Um, we serve global brands like Airbnb, Uber, Deliveroo, all the way down to individuals. So bloggers, couples, families. Um, and it's just really awesome when you see the galleries that come through, a proposal that happened, or uh, a new video footage for a new company. Um, that definitely sinks in that, you know, it, 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 our work matters and you can see the impact of it. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And it's, it's interesting how, you know, those little moments that you could think about maybe not being anything. Like if you, if you yeah. just told somebody, you know, every night while I was in, you know, this little Nepali village, I, you know, counted my money cause I was bored. Somebody yeah. could be like, Oh, that sounds terrible. Like, yeah. What, like, what is impact does that have on anything? But really that, you know, inspired you to think a little bit deeper about what you were doing with your life and how you could make a bigger impact and help to create a company that is now quite successful. I think part of it, it's also, that's why we travel, right? We travel not to maybe in the beginning to, to sort of what we we're talking about in the beginning, it was checking things off bucket list and smashing as many quantity as possible, not over the quality. Um, and then at some point it becomes, you're traveling to just experience the unexpected. It's those unplanned, unexpected moments where you have some sort of a takeaway. And I couldn't have planned that, um, had I scheduled it somehow and tried to fit it in and buy a ticket for it. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, you know, obviously there's been a lot that's happened since then to get to where you are now. Can you talk a little bit about taking, you know, that from this idea that you had there to actually starting to implement it and then grow it? Mm. So we um, started about a year ago. And at the time, it was first uh, only the marketplace product, um, only for individuals and consumers. So um, the first layer was just amassing and inviting these creators around the world. Um, and we did a concerted effort to try to find specifically uh, those with the significant following on uh, online. And so it wasn't just about finding a creator that you can search for anyway on Google, but finding someone with influence, with taste, um, and being able to work with them affordably and on demand. Um, it then grew from um, shooting families and couples into more of the corporate component as well. Um, I think with individuals, there's always significant moments on the calendar year, like anniversaries, birthdays, travels that uh, cement why they would want a service like Wandersnap. 
Um, but then for businesses, month to month, they have content needs for social events, product, um, et cetera. So being able to support those businesses also using the same uh, group of creators, uh, that's what we grew into. Um, and then most recently, we also had a new innovation in what we call live photos. So the whole idea was um, most people, if they don't try Wondersnap, it's because they think, well, my iPhone X is awesome enough. The photos are great. It's instant. I can even edit it. Um, mm. And that's completely well warranted. So we wanted to challenge uh, DSLRs to be able to deliver edited work instantly. And that's the tool that we build. Um, it's for now a photographer's tool, but just imagine as your snappers clicking away at your travel shoots, um, the moment he presses the button, those photos are already automatically edited, uh, watermarked and uploaded to a page that the customer can see. Um, so in the future, being able to serve that for brides, um, where in the morning after the wedding, they're not posting an iPhone photo that they got married. Um, but an edited DSLR curated image, um, which ultimately I think that's the quality uh, that we should all be entitled to. Yeah, that's amazing that you've been able to take that and make that so fast. I mean, that really is the dream. There's like nothing worse when you look at your phone after like an event the night before and you're like, I got nothing good on my on my phone last night. <laughs> Correct. And, you know, even for businesses, it's the idea of considering user generated content was such a buzzword three, four years ago. And sadly now, a lot of user generated content just isn't high quality enough. And the users themselves are not motivated to post about a hotel if they're not proud of that shot. But to be able to hire someone to come and do it without waiting for a day or a week, um, then I think that closes the gap on quality and instant um, content um, and whether that's for the business case or families or couples, um, we want to bring that um, to as many people as possible. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. And I, I'm curious, so if I'm a consumer, so say I'm over in, in Thailand, for example, and I want to get some sort of photo shoot done, maybe like a yoga photo shoot because I'm a yoga teacher as well. <laughs> yep. How would it actually work for me as a consumer to use Wandersnap? Yeah, our intent was that it should be very straightforward. So let's say um, you're about to do a retreat somewhere or you're going to a destination. You just search by the location um, and then I'll populate a list of creators um, by budget, by availability and style. Um, so some are, let's say, experts in sports photography. So you'll see um, very much uh, the more trainer uh, active uh, type fitness uh, photos that they've done. Or you might work with, want to work with someone who is more just a portrait photographer. So it's less about the muscles and the definition as it is about you and the landscape and your facial expressions. Um, you might want to work with someone who is of journalistic specialty. So these are the ones who wouldn't coach you and they would shoot very documentary style behind the scenes um, to your practice. Um, and then once you've identified someone you want to work with, you can see their review, their previous works, their social following. Um, then you just click book now um, and then uh, the request is sent. Uh, payment can be settled via our site. And then ultimately the gallery is also transferred and kept on Wondersap. Um, so our guests don't need to worry about keeping different Dropbox links and Google photos. Um, it's all aggregated all in the same place. Yeah, that's really cool. Over so over the course of a year building something like this, I know you know definitely a massive challenge, very very hard. But it also, um, I'm sure you know a lot of your initial assumptions and ideas kind of get um, as you start interacting with customers, start to start to change. What would you say are some of the biggest things that you um, from like the business sense like learned about what people are looking for with like you know when they're trying to hire for photo shoots have been over the course of that year. It's like asking, where's your favorite country again? <laughs> I start. <laughs> um, no, I think the most standout lessons, if you will, um, there are a couple. I think on the, on the guest experience in itself, regardless of what the amount that a guest is paying for or what they're crafting, the fact is they are booking for a special moment and you can't 
judge or evaluate which guest moment is more special. They're all special. So being able to train and coach ourselves to show up the same way um, and support every guest, regardless of what they're asking for or shooting for, that's really unique to the Wander Samp experience. And it's on us to really um, continue to work on. Um, I think um, initially uh, thinking that uh, it was only a B2C business was also quite different. Um, now that it's more than B2C and, and being able to do live and B2B, that was a pivot that we weren't expecting from day one. Uh, but it has definitely um, changed our business for the better. Um, I think internally on, you know, I, I come from a background of running big teams, big budgets, and I, I presumed I was a pretty good team leader. Um, but inherently when you're hiring someone to work on something smaller on leaner budgets, longer hours, and just almost contingent on this fiery passion to see the same future you do, the motivations are different and supporting that team dynamic requires different skills. And that was a pretty hard lesson that I needed to learn, I think in the first year. Um, and lastly, just growing something that was multi-region from day one. Um, how do you work with a team that sits in different places and support the creators who are also sprawled all around the world. And then making sure that a guest in the middle of Seoul, Korea is taken care of. Um, those are just processes that we had to set up. Um, but I'm grateful for my team to last and survive and get through with the first year together. Um, and it's, it's still a lot of fun every day. Yeah, I, I was actually, so I was thinking about that, that it must be interesting, especially uh, um, on the creator side, because you're dealing with people from, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned 50 plus cities. I'm not sure how many countries that is, but probably quite a lot. So lots of different countries, lots yeah. of different cultures. Yeah. Have there been any, um, you know, weird, weird moments or um, stories from, you know, trying, reaching out and having to work with so many people from so many different cultures on the same um, solution, I guess. Absolutely. So I think having been well traveled, preconditioned again to just at least be sensitive or cognizant that there are differences. But even then, I mean, uh, we, we've iterated now where during the snappers onboarding process, you actually have to watch a series of videos, um, answer a quiz in order to pass whether or not you're fit to take clients. And some of that stems from uh, for example, for our more Muslim guests uh, coming in from Malaysia or Indonesia, they have expectations around how a male photographer may or may not interact with a female guest. Um, and that was just something that we hadn't standardized for. Or let's say if we have um, Indian families visiting Hong Kong and Singapore, um, how the snapper dresses is interpreted as respect or lack thereof. Um, regardless of what the temperature is outside, they have expectations that you should be fully covered. And these are things that culturally, even if the team is aware of, how do we communicate forth that? So then it sets our creators up for success and not put them in um, sort of strange situations. Um, of course, our creators in Korea and Japan um, they are less uh, eloquent in English, perhaps, um, or they feel like they're less comfortable, even though they're great. So being able to give them support so then they can serve foreign guests, um, that's something on us to do. But at the end of the day, the magic of what we do is that regardless of where they came from, how much experience they have following, you just marvel sometimes at the genuine creativity that these individuals have. Um, one example is uh, one creator in the middle of Jogjakarta, Indonesia, which is a fantastic destination that everyone should go check out. Um, but it's not one that you hear about often. And this guy, Dian, he just creates like no one I've seen. It's, it's even those who are in the middle of a city, it's just not the same kind of creativity. So if we could profile that individual, bring him business and ultimately celebrate his visual arts, um, that's what we are in the business of doing. And it's really awesome day to day. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, it's incredible that you've been able to give, you know, entrepreneurs of all ages, this opportunity to, you know, sell the skill they want, because 
I would imagine that it's even harder to become a full-time photographer in a developing country than it is in a developed country. But you hear consistently, you know, stories of people who have a passion for something in the arts or something creative, and they're just not able to make it because they don't know how to market themselves or they don't know how to find those clients. And having a platform like that really allows them to kind of have that opportunity. And that's exactly the point that you strike on um, our impact program. So um, we also, I also didn't want to start this company just as a vanity exercise, help people get more likes, more following. That's not meaningful. Um, it was how can we bring these dignified creative jobs to more corners of the world where uh, typically a youth might otherwise be in hospitality, F&B, uh, driving a tuk-tuk. And I'm not saying that those are not dignified jobs. It's just that the income upward potential is significantly limited. Uh, there are pay scales, there are um, minimum wage cadences, whereas doing something as a creative, you set your own price. And with experience and reviews, you can actually quickly adjust that rate without much hindrance. And being able to create these job opportunities in faraway places. Um, at the end of the day, that's what our vision is, um, and we should be able to do more of. So our impact program actually uses $5 per booking to go back to our training programs. We work with various NGOs around the region um, where they're already providing vocational training to their uh, groups. Uh, we just come in and support with photography training. Um, so then at the least, some of these individuals may choose to earn an income creating art and be supported to do so. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's cool. Yeah. So uh, when you started the company, did you also decide to leave Shanghai at that time? Mm, it was bittersweet. I had personal reasons of why I moved back down to Hong Kong, but then also um, I think it was definitely technically easier to create a company in Hong Kong than it was in China, the capital involved legal framework. Um, and our business from day one wanted to be regional rather than China focused. Um, so being in a Southeast Asia hub um, also appealed to us in terms of resources. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. I think Hong Kong is one of the easiest countries in the world to set up a business as a foreigner. Am I correct? Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, something we've kind of looked into a little bit. I think I was pretty sure Hong Kong came up on that list. Oh, um, so. yeah, just the ease of setup is definitely top notch. Of course, day to day, the overhead is a very, very expensive city, if not one of the most. Um, so those challenges come after, but the setup, um, it's very foreigner friendly. What is it like, you know, uh, Obviously, similar in many ways, but obviously very different in other ways. Um, what's, been, what's it been like, you know, after living six years in mainland China to move and, and set up in Hong Kong? That's a, that's a fiery question. <laughs> that we're, um, of course, both states have just gone through such an intertwined history. Sometimes I also um, have guests who I have friends who come visit, um, and many don't even know necessarily that Hong Kong was actually part of British colonial rule for 99 years and it only handed back to China in 1997. And so this is, uh, I always like to say it's like in a family, Hong Kong is the kid that went overseas to UK for exchange. And then now he's back and now he's trying to figure out uh, how to get along with the parents, how to get along with other siblings like Shanghai, Beijing, Macau, um, and then trying to find an identity of its own. Um, so for me, it's, you see that difference where Shanghai was all about growth, trial and error. No one cared if you made a mistake. You just go for it. Things move quick. Um, being back in Hong Kong, it's safer. There's more frameworks. There's more protection. Um, but things definitely move slower. It's still this transient phase figuring out, is it a financial hub? Does it want to be a tech hub? Um, does it want to take advantage of cryptocurrency activities? Like, what is that identity? Um, day to day, of course, as a startup, just uh, grinding away here, it doesn't really affect much, but ultimately it does stem to, is this a place that I want to stay around in? Um, and what kind of city would that be? And how may I contribute to it? Yeah, definitely. 
And I was just going to ask, actually, what do you what do you see for the foreseeable future with you know your plans with your business with Wandersnap? Yeah, we're very committed to um, the live um, photo business, um, and then as well as just growing our marketplace products. Um, the the fun part of what we do is our success does not depend on us sitting in a certain place or city. Um, it's a pretty location dependent um, opportunity. So uh, that's almost part of the magic of the team. Um, and so we'll continue doing that uh, while working hard to bring our service to as many families, couples and businesses as possible. Uh, my ultimate dream um, would be to settle back in Bali um, in Indonesia. That's just a strange place that I feel the most at home. So at some point this lifetime, I'll get back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We spent a couple months in Bali uh, last year when we were in Asia, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing island. My friend, used, um, my friend uh, was telling me that he says uh, Bali is life, and I couldn't agree more. It's mm-hmm. life in that it's outdoors, it's eating well, focusing on mindfulness, being nourished by nature, beach, jungle, you name your like nature of choice. It's just such a magical place. Um, so yeah, Bali is life. <laughs> and so you've been living overseas for, for quite a long time. Uh, is there anything that you miss in particular about Canada? Mm, I, uh, I haven't seen snow, um, the Canadian way in a long time. I've seen a lot of, um, snow when I'm in Europe or in China, but I don't know. There's just something like very calm and peaceful. Probably someone listening from Vancouver wouldn't think of that. (laughs) Um, So I miss that. Um, Trivially, of course, all the best sushi. I think it's still in Vancouver. Um, Tim Hortons, French vanilla. It's still great. (laughs) Uh, The simple things in life. Um, But genuinely, you know, it's, it's such a privilege to grow up in Vancouver because it is one of the most stunning cities with the balance of work and play. Um, I haven't lived in a city where people get off work sharp at six to go surf or cocktail before eating well. Like I just haven't been in that environment for a long time. And I cherish that, you know, Vancouver still prides itself on that. Um, it's a very balanced um, city. So that's something that I miss dearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's it's kind of interesting because this is our third winter, fourth winter. Third. We haven't we haven't been home for winter for a while, and it's it's kind of funny because you know all the photos start coming up from our Canadian friends, and I'm watching these Instagram stories from my friends who are starting to ski in Banff and whatnot. I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice. And then one of the temperatures like shows up on one of the stories and it's like negative 20 C. And I'm like, nope, I'm good here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm all good. And just the fact that, you know, the like fitness plays such a big role on West Coast. Um, it's not strange to say, oh, let's go for a run. And then let's go do like, I don't know, let's, let's go swim after that. And then let's do another hike. Um, it, there's just not very many cities that are so fit conscious. And I feel like being Canadian, that's something ingrained into our lifestyle. Um, and it's something so important to keep up with, um, even after you've left Canada and you're on life on the road, right? Yeah, definitely. It's probably because we have, you know, the best workout gear. And so you spend a hundred dollars on stretchy pants and you've got to use them. (laughs) So if there's anyone out there who's listening, who's like, wow, this is so cool. Like I've always dreamed of starting my own business or turning my idea into um, a business while traveling. Um, What would be, you know, your biggest piece of advice for that person? Hmm. I think from day one, it's, cutting out the noise and knowing why you're doing it. Um, if you just wanted to travel and start something, there's probably very many other configurations that does not involve starting a company that can be blogging, that can be writing, that can be teaching fitness, that can be, um, being paid to like read books and then, and then, and then write a review. There's uh, so many configurations. Um, but if the intent was to leave a legacy and do something meaningful, Pend to you and your name, uh, you and your team's name, um, then you need to have that vision because there are days when the travel gets tough, the business gets tough, and those are the days that that vision still rings true and you push through and you get up another day and you keep trying. Um, so having that why in the beginning rather than just the noise of wanting the lifestyle, 
I think that's a pretty honest question to ask to get started. Yeah, definitely. I love that. And so if people want to find out more about yourself, your travels, as well as what you guys do over at Wandersnap, where can they go to find you? Yeah, just check out our um, wandersnap.co URL or our Facebook, Instagram page, um, or my own personal Instagram. It's usually where I keep all my travel content. And that's long story short with two O's. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And we'll link to all of that in the show notes as well so that people can easily find it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Jen. Thank you so much for having me, guys. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at World Wanders One. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.